Hi, everyone. Well, thank you for having us here. This is really, really exciting. Uh, my name is Vinod. I'm a partner at a fund called Molten Ventures. We're a slightly later stage fund in Europe investing at Series A and Series B. Uh, and today I have with me one of my wonderful founders, uh, Rafal Modruski, who runs a company called iSci. And I just wanted to quickly you know, tell you a story about, you know, when we first met, uh, we were originally introduced by Tim Draper and Q at what was at the time Draper Nexus. And I, and I remember the way the way they gave me a glowing review about you made me instantaneously need to know how am I going to get in front of you, right? And then I had a chance to meet you, and we came to see your team, and we got an idea about what you're building. And there, there, there aren't many opportunities in venture capital where a team that you're about to back strikes you like they might be generational, that this might be a once-in-a-generation type of company and a, and a group of people. And then when you have the conversation at investment committee, it starts to become a little bit larger than life. Like there are very few opportunities where you get to do something that is bigger than ourselves. And today, I just wanted to have that opportunity to go back in time, to have that conversation again, because we met you in 2017. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, how, that, how the early stages of building something in deep tech came together for you? And what, what did that mean for you when you came up with the idea, when you were still at university? How did you think about your early team? Could you share some ideas with us? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, fantastic to be here again. Uh, I love this stage, love speaking here at Slash. Uh, not my first time. Uh, we are very proud to be one of uh, one of uh, Finnish companies and uh, love to share the, the story of ISAI with, with all of you. Um, you know, thank you for the kind words. Uh, uh, this was not scripted, so I, I'm <laughs> a little bit uh, a little bit now shy. I didn't expect that you'd say so many great things. You know, uh, you guys probably don't know, but. Vinod has actually made his investment decision within 18 days uh, from That's the correct. moment when he received the call about ISI to the moment he put down, I think it was $5 million check. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was less than three weeks. So this is a pretty amazing story. Um, before his investment, so, so what happened? Uh, ISI starts at the university. Uh, you guys have heard from the, the, the people that have announced us over here. Uh, we do design uh, and we manufacture satellites. We have a, a small satellite factory, or actually nowadays a big satellite factory. We build about 25 satellites every year. Then we buy space and rockets. We launch those satellites into space, and we, we build all the software that, um, that is necessary in order to manage those satellites and then take pictures. The satellites themselves, they, they take pictures of the Earth. They are so-called Earth observation satellites. They allow you to know what's happening everywhere around the world uh, within hours from, from a queue. So you can ask for a place. Uh, anywhere around the globe of within an hour or two, our satellite is going to be there. And we use what's called a radar imaging system or a SAR system. So this image that you're going to take is going to be worth the time. So it's going to work regardless of weather condition or time of day. So uh, at night, we see everything that's happening. And through clouds, any, any weather conditions, we see everything that's happening. So indeed, the story sort of is such that uh, one day, Around 2013, myself and, and the co-founder Pekka, uh, we were actually sitting uh, uh, at the university lab and, and wondering about starting a company. And back in those days, starting a space company was actually quite a quite a thing. There were multiple people doing that, and we decided to to start one too. Um, so I think it's it's a pretty exciting story. You know, it it goes back all the way to a university program. We were part of a, a program of, at Alto University called Alto One. That's where, where we've learned throughout about a year of time that you can build smaller satellites, you can do it with, with fewer people, with less money than in the past. And those satellites, although significantly smaller and cheaper, aren't actually that much worse than the big guys. And uh, we thought that that would be a good idea. You know, we were, we were very, I was, I was 22, he was 23. And uh, we had nothing to lose. And we said, look, why don't we take a leap of faith and decide that it's a fantastic idea to start a company that's going to build a lot of satellites. Um, well, and it worked. Well, let's, let's double click on a few parts of that early journey, right? So what was the, you know, to quote Ben Horowitz, like the hard thing about hard things, right? What was really, really hard when you were in 2013, 2014, you came up with the idea, how did you 
one, gather a bit of the money. Two, how did you recruit your early team? Yeah, so I think you know we were probably uh, more successful with, with recruitment than we were with, with fundraising. I have to say, I mean, we, we've raised quite a lot of money at the end of the day. Today, we, we've raised probably over $440 million. million. Uh, so we, we did this in, in a few rounds, but I have to say it has never been my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> And uh, thanks God you invested so quickly, man. It was, it's, it's not been easy. Uh, you know, the, one of the hardest things for ISA at the beginning was actually fundraising. Back in 2013, 14, 15, uh, investing in deep tech, uh, satellite technology in, in Europe and in Finland was, was not a thing. Uh, it wasn't easy to prove the case. And, and imagine that uh, actually we were the first company that decided to miniaturize the synthetic aperture radar technology. There weren't any competitors when I was fundraising for the first time. So I actually had to fend off a lot of the questions. How come nobody else is doing this? I always thought that the fact that I'm the first is a great idea, but the, this, this was not the case for, for many of the investors. So I can, you know, one lesson learned that I, I can draw from that in the hindsight is, is I remember this very vividly. You know, it took us probably two years of persistent conversations with investors. And one of the things that, that I, I can't forget right now is, you know, every single time we would go to one of the investors, and, and they are, you know, they are actually a Finnish investor, very well-known Finnish investor, they would say, this is great, you guys are great, it's way too early for us, come back in six months. And I wondered every single time I left that room, do they really want me to come back in six months, or are they just saying so that I would forget about this and, and you know, and sort let it go? Sort of what was behind the question. Well, exactly, right? And, uh, uh, you know, we, we didn't forget. Uh, we, would, we would say, okay, we are going to come back in six months. We would build more of the stuff. We would, we would talk more with the customers. And then six months later, we would be back with our story again. And I have to say, this happened at least three times. And, uh, and I was ready to give up. And then one day, out of nothing, I was, we were sitting in the lab and they, they, you know, they called up. I picked up the phone. They said, look, there's another investor over here from the Bay Area that I would love you to meet. You have to go there right now. The guy has just arrived and he's living in two hours and you've got to go there right now. And I did. Uh, and I remember pitching this, this very hard because I was quite desperate already, very excited. I came over to pitch. A third person joined and this guy started to be more interested in this person's shoes than my pitch. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is the worst, the worst pitch ever. Uh, but you know, they, they left and uh, I think this investment actually closed within a month after that. And who was that? And that was True Ventures. Uh, that was True Ventures. The True Ventures team has been with us since, since the beginning. So True Ventures was the, the, the team that I have met at the time uh, with the shoes and Lifeline are actually the guys that have uh, kept on pushing us forward over time. And, and you know, they've been with us uh, since. When it comes to recruitment, you know, I, I have to say it's very true from our perspective that at the beginning, the first team that you're going to recruit, at least for us, uh, are your friends. Uh, it's very hard to start with, we started with two people. Uh, you have no money, you have an idea, uh, you have no customers, no experience as such. I don't think you can just go out there and start you know, um, poaching people out of SpaceX. At least that's not what we, what we did back then. I very vividly remember that the, the very first people, the very first seven to nine to almost 15 employees were the buddies from the university, both my university in Poland as well as the university in Finland. And, uh, and they got the ones convinced and they formed the founding team. So I think that, you know, for me, I look back at those times and I'm actually thinking that that was the, the right thing to do. Uh, so if you're about to start a deep tech startups, I think, uh, you know, making sure that you've got a lot of friends that do that is a good idea. And you specifically mentioned that even, even amongst that early group of people that you recruited, you self-selected yourself into a group of people that actually wanted to build. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, it, it cannot be all your friends that you're going to hire. Uh, I think that many people will give you the advice that don't hire your friends. It's not a good idea. What if things go, go wrong? It is true. I remember thinking about this a lot. Uh, we've had situations in which we hired our friends and then it wasn't the best outcome at the end of the day. I think over time everybody became mature and, and, and you know, things were back to normal. Uh, but you do have to select, right? So, so we did select those people that were sitting with us in the lab at midnight every day. And, and those ones were the ones that we knew that really had this sort of passion and attitude for creating things no matter what. And uh, those guys became the founding team in the early days. Changing gears a little bit. So, uh, you know, could you talk to us about some of the challenges we've had in the early days of, like, for example, X1, which is the first satellite we ever put into orbit. 
Uh, talk to us about how you went through that process. What did it feel like to get something into orbit and all the uh, sequence of events after? Yeah, so I mean, for, for all of you that are either about to start a, a deep tech startup or, or are, are thinking of doing this, I can tell you that the journey is, is, is challenging. I, I think the journey is challenging for any startup, to be fair, uh, but the deep tech has a tendency of not working. Um, you know, this, this is something that we have learned the hard way. We've launched our first satellite and it, uh, it actually worked. Uh, it was quite exciting the first time. I remember, I mean, I, I remember ISAX-1, it worked. It started delivering imagery. It actually captured the first image of, of Arctic ice cap uh, within 24 hours from, from launch, so, so super fast. Uh, we, were, we were very excited and we actually started a whole new fundraising based on the, of the success. We got deep into that fundraising, I think three months into the journey. Uh, we were already collecting documents to sign up for the old people for the, for the next fundraise. And that's when, that's when it happened. Um, that's when we, we've lost contact with the, with the system. Uh, and honestly, we've never heard from it again. Uh, so it was a moment, I remember I was, I was traveling in, in Kuwait back then and, and Pekka was on holidays as well. Um, and the guys called us from the lab and said, look, there was one orbit, we've heard everything was fine. Then another orbit, we have heard nothing. And since then, we've been trying to look for it, and we, we don't know where it is. I mean, we know where it is, but we, we can't get connected with it. So, of course, you've got a few theories, and you know, at first, you, you have a lot of hope that it's going to come back to you, but it, but it didn't. Um, and I remember very, very much as, as we had to kind of come, come forward and, uh, and pass on this message to the investors that were about to sign up. This was not the easiest thing in life, but you know, that was the moment in time when I remember we've had a very hard conversation with the investors that we we were about to bring on board and we said like look this isn't something that's like people don't know how to do this this isn't something that that you can just just go to your garage and build this there, is this there is new stuff right there is there isn't a, a recipe for this so it's bound to we are bound to have failures on the way on the way to success and if you're not ready for those failures today then maybe you're not the right investor for us and uh, there was actually a fund that, that almost, almost uh, decided to drop out, but two days later they thought about it and they, and they, and they came back. I'll tell you from, from our own internal reflection, so as we were halfway through our process and, and you called us up and you said, hey, uh, we got some trouble with X1, the first, the first thing we asked you was, uh, what are your diagnostics, right? Like, so what have you figured out about what you think you could have done better? And I remember the answers, like there are a few things that you felt like you could have had on that satellite, for example, a 24-hour automatic reset schedule. And when you gave us that answer, what it said to us is like there was a trade-off between speed and being perfect. And what we needed to understand is which risk curve were we going to underwrite? Were we going to underwrite enough risk that we'd be fast and we'd have enough of a coverage on the constellation? Or were we going to be perfect but late and never quite get there? And, and your answers were what gave us confidence. So we did the investment anyway. And I think ever since, you know, we've been building from strength to strength. Now, just moving on a little bit to like slightly later part of the journey, um, how did you find your story and narrative evolving through that time from going from a space tech company, which is by default a, a deep tech company into much more of a dual use company actually? And, and how do you think about that evolution and what it has done for you, your team, and how you've raised money? Yeah, I think this is, this is going to be a, a bit of a long topic. So, you know, we started ISI, as you guys, many of you may know, when you, when you decompose the name of the company, it's, it's ICE and I. Uh, that's, how, that's how smart we were in the early days. <laughs> so uh, we went on to, you know, we, we decided to build satellites in order to measure the consequences of climate change. We really wanted to measure the ice caps. Um, have the, the right view of the eyes in order to enable Arctic shipping. And that was the, the intention. I, I don't think back then, back in 2013, 14, anybody was really thinking about anything else. It is true very much so that, that any deep tech, at least the way I see it, is, is sort of a dual use tech. Uh, that means that you've got commercial civilian applications and, and you've got the, the security defense related applications. I don't think there is a way out of this. Uh, GPS is, is really one of the best examples. So for us, you know, there were really two moments on the sort of geopolitical climate that has, uh, has made a huge impact. Uh, first was, was actually uh, Russian invasion in Crimea. That 
enacted a, a whole set of sanctions, uh, made Arctic Ocean virtually impossible to do business in, and, and we had to pivot away from building satellites for ice monitoring because all those companies that were going to ship their, their goods through the, the Russian Arctic uh, were not allowed to do that anymore. Um, and so that was the first big thing. And uh, little that we know that it was actually just the start, uh, you know, obviously 2022, when the, the full-scale invasion happened, was, was a massive transition. And that's when we as founders and as, as the owners of the company, the whole company as, as a team, were faced with a relatively difficult choice. You know, we knew that we had a dual-use capability, but now we were being asked to actually make that dual-use capability available for the security needs of, uh, of a cause that I, I truly believe is just, uh, but it is not an easy choice. So we... How, how did you, maybe just to expand on that, like how did your main, your exact team go about debating that topic with you? People would have had polarizing opinions, people would be on two sides of different equations. I mean, very, very much so. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's um, it, life is not black and white. This situation is probably more black and white than, than many. Um, now, nonetheless, you have to weigh in the, the risks on wise, one side and, and the sort of the consequences of saying no on the other. Um, I think, you know, we've sort of run through this theory of what happens if we don't do it, uh, what's really going to be put in that place. At the end of the day, that was quite a long discussion. We used our board. We, we, we tried to talk as, as much with, with our employees as, as possible. But I think, you know, we did decide to take on that call. And, uh, and as many guys of you may know, ISIS satellites have actually been working in support of the, of the war in Ukraine for the last 24 months, and, uh, and we've been very active in doing so. And uh, we are actually today uh, extremely proud of this, non no matter how, how challenging the, the thing is. Um, and that has, you know, if you, if you think about it, converted the world massively. I'm actually starting to see this, and, and you might have observed this over here as well. Uh, two years ago, uh, things like deep tech uh, and defense tech nowadays is being given use. Nobody has, nobody used the word defense word. tech whatsoever, right? Like there was, there was no investments into, into defense tech. Nobody, nobody really cared about it. The opposite, whenever people saw a dual use technology, I remember that we didn't receive certain amount of investment five years back because the technology was dual use, right? So people would say, oh, you know, it's a great technology for climate change, but it also has a second use. Uh, we don't really want to support that. Uh, that's not something that we want to do. And we were like, okay, how do you want us to build a, a high deep tech situation without it being a dual use story? Now, the funny thing is that the tide has turned almost 180 degrees today. People come over to us and say, hey, now we realize that what you are doing is actually fundamental to providing global security. That data that you're collecting you know, is going to change the way we're looking at the world from the security geopolitical perspective. And the, and the demand for, for our services has, has really skyrocketed through the roof. So, um, you know, the transition from what it used to be over for what it is today has, has really been massive. A couple, of, a couple of statistics I picked up on the, on the way here. Uh, defense tech obviously has now become a bit of a thing in the last two years. Uh, in Europe, it actually forms a very, very small part of the total VC fundraisings. So far, it's about 2% is what I've been told. And over the period of the last three years, about $3 billion has gone into, that, into, the, into the sector. And you, you appear, ISAC counts as a company within that broader sector. But when you think today about the balance of what you need to get right in, in dual use, between commercial use cases and, and, and defense use cases, how do, you think about, how do you think about what you drive your teams to deliver for you? Because they all come out of one platform. They all come out of the same synthetic aperture radar satellites. But when you think about where time is spent, how should an early stage founder today think about which narrative suits them and who can they recruit and which products can they build and where will they get revenue from? Not an easy one. Not an easy one. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I think from the product perspective, the truth is that, that we have not changed the product KPIs as much as, as, much as one, one may think. Um, the truth is that the system, as we make it better and better over time, uh, it benefits both parts of the spectrum when it comes to the customers, right? So our customers are also insurance companies, uh, banks, you know, we help them manage flood situation, we help them manage wildfire situation, earthquakes, volcano eruptions. Um, and it turns out that what we need to develop when it comes to the satellite technology or the software in order to be able to better manage floods is virtually the same thing that we have to develop to manage better challenging geopolitical situations. So I think when it comes to the product roadmap, 
it really stayed the same. Um, I think what we had to really adjust is we had to adjust how are we going to think about our sales. And this was a big pivot in, in the story of the company. And I think that today, I truly believe that it's going to be very hard for deep tech companies to exist if they don't think of governments as, as true customer for some of their programs. I think if you're, you're building a lot of deep tech situ capability, especially if this is a highly dual use situation, you know, today, the government-driven revenue actually represents close to 90% of ISA's revenue. And I think that that number may even grow over time because there is so much demand today. And, and we've looked at this, this you know, long and hard. Uh, I can tell you that investors don't really like the fact that the governments are generating so much revenue. But the governments are a customer. They are a good customer. They are a customer in demand. And I think you know, we've seen situations in which peers of ours have said, no, we've assumed from the beginning of the existence of the company that we will never sell to government anything. Mm. And that strategy hasn't really worked for them very well. Right? So when it comes to one of those pivotal moments in the history of the company, is when we said, we're not just going to sell imaging service, we are going to sell constellations of satellites to those governments that need constellations of satellites to be operated in a sovereign way so that they can provide security for their nations. And that has really, really changed the trajectory of the revenue generation. And I will, you know, I will encourage you guys all, if you are building deep tech company, think about the government part as the customer. It's a different sales cycle, it's a different sales methodology, but it's actually a very real and a very good customer. And it's, it's, I think it's only growing to grow in importance over the next 24, 36 months. Looking to the future, um, we've come a long way. Uh, I think safe to say we've 100x our revenue from when I first met you. Uh, you crossed the 100 million revenue mark. You starting to build what might be, you know, to, to my original point about you becoming a generational business in, in, in a European generational business, you know, up in the likes of Anduril and Palantir, like globally. How do you think about what's next beyond satellites? Right. So I, I think, you know, What's exciting about ISAI for, for many of the people that join us and for many of the investors that join us is that as we, as we look at the product roadmap and the market that we are addressing, it doesn't seem that we are anywhere near to the end of it, right? It's uh, when we do the analysis and, and you know... And, and, Very much and, day zero. I'm glad that you are nodding because I, think, I hope that that's the case. Look, we, we see that $100 million revenue, which we, which we did last year, is it's very much a start and there is at least a 10x that we can go for, if not more. It's actually quite exciting um, and maybe a little bit almost frustrating that in Europe we have not had a chance yet to develop companies like Palantir. If you guys have looked at Palantir's stock over the last 24 months, it's, it's a skyrocketing stock. It it's clearly emphasizes the fact that those kind of companies are here to stay. And over the next, until the end of this decade, this is really going to be a pattern that is, that is really going to emerge. And there's a ton of growth within these capabilities because the world is in a stage that it is. And uh, we have to figure out how technology can help us manage this. From our perspective, you know, we've started with, with synthetic aperture radar, with radar imaging systems. Uh, now we know that that was really just the beginning. We think of ISI as, a, as an information company. You really want to, you know, we want to know as much about the world as there is to know, whether that's a challenging environment or not a challenging environment. So I can, you know, I can tell that uh, outside of just growing the constellation, today we've got about 20 satellites in the constellation, we probably want to get to about 100. There is other sensors, there is optical staff, there is signal intelligence sensors, uh, there is thermal infrared sensors. All of those provide you whole new sets of layers of information. And now when you, when you think of the, the AI stuff that's, that's coming about, I mean, the more information you can collect, especially the more information of high quality that you can collect, the more and the quicker you can understand what sort of decisions are the right decisions. And I will say, you know, people look at ISA very often and they think, okay, that's a space tech company. Those guys are going to stay in space. We have already moved past that. Uh, we've been thinking for quite a long time what is going to be the next step for ISA. And I think that multi-domain awareness, when you trade the global coverage for the local coverage and you stop using just the space-based domain, but you're looking at aerospace, you're looking at ground-based sensors, if you can really harness that capability, put it all into one software that's going to, in a quick way, speed out the decision-making outcomes that you need in order to make your tactical and operational decisions, that's what I truly believe the future is going to bring for ISA. 
what an extraordinary story. I think, I mean, just working with you has been one of the highlights of, of my career so far. And I, you know, that, that this last answer on sort of what the vision becomes and where the company goes, extraordinary. Rafael, I think that's all we have the time for today. Thank you so much for joining me on stage and thank you all for being here. Thank you guys, thank you.